Behind me, I've got a closet full of clothes that are different colors and different sizes. I should probably mention that I'm not the most organized person, so there's no actual format as to how I've laid things out. And I've been trying to look for my favorite sweater for ages now, and I simply cannot find it because it requires me to look through each and every single pile of clothes to see if it's present there. And the worst case scenario is that it's present in the last one and I would have wasted so much time. But replace the concept of me searching through clothes with someone who's looking through data sets to find a desired piece of information. Many industrial companies actually face this challenge on a day-to-day -day basis. They're unable to locate the most relevant data or find a particular data set that they're looking for because after all, they have millions if not billions of data sets to look through. Your first instinct might be though, let's just run it through a computer. Computers can find anything, right? And although that is true to an extent, this is actually a problem where our classical computers are not much faster than us because they would evaluate it in the exact same way. Let's take a look. Check out this list of numbers. There's 10 different variables here with different values, and one of them is a winning number, basically the one that we're looking for. A classical computer's code looks exactly like this, and if none of it makes sense, don't worry at all. Essentially what's happening is the computer is given a list of number and then it defines an oracle, which you can think of as a black box that contains operations. The input will go in and if the oracle determines it's the winning value, it'll apply some sort of a transformation or order on that variable before it outputs. Anyways, once the oracle does its job of identifying the winning value, it's outputted for the user and we can also figure out how many queries, which is another word for tries, were made. In a classical approach, the computer evaluates each and every number sequentially until it finds the winning number. So what if the number was the last one amongst a million different data sets? Two things. One, that's exactly how we would approach the situation. And two, we'd waste so much time. Mathematically, this can be represented through ON, where O is on the order of and N refers to the length of the list. This simply illustrates the worst case execution time for this problem. But there's no need to panic because quantum computers exist and they can handle this problem really well. If you're like me one year ago and going quantum what inside of your head, basically quantum computing is a way that we can tackle problems that are too large or too complex for our conventional computers using the law of quantum mechanics, which is the physics of extremely small matter. Instead of using bits that are zero or one, they use something called quantum bits, aka qubits, and these can be in a superposition state of zero and one at the same time. Except when you measure a qubit, the superposition disappears and the qubit collapses into a definitive state of zero or one, basically like classical computers. And this is based on the probability of a qubit. Don't worry too much about it, but those are simply just a few basics that you'll need to know to fully understand how this algorithm works. Now on to nerding out about quantum computers and how they can accelerate the process of determining our winning value. This is all thanks to Love Grover, who created what's formally referred to as Grover's algorithm. It can search through unstructured data at a much faster speed, square root of n times to be exact. Even though it may not seem like a huge deal, when you've got these extremely large numbers in front of you, taking the square root of it can completely change and fasten the process by a lot. Take a look at this graph here. It perfectly illustrates the significant difference between classical computers and quantum computers. But Let's get on to the exciting part where we can finally break down our code. Essentially, the process can be broken down into three different steps. We can start off by initializing the qubits, then applying an oracle reflection, and then after applying another transformation that will reverse that reflection, but also increase the probability of the winning value so it has the greatest probability when being measured. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at this problem with two qubits, which means there are four total states, so four potential options present. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Today, the winning value we'll be searching for is 1, 1. After importing all the required libraries, our code starts off by creating the quantum circuit and initializing it by forming something called uniform superposition, which is simply a special state we'll consider. This is done through applying what's known as a Hadamard gate on the qubits. Graphically, the state of our problem currently looks like this. All values are the same in height, so think of it like they all have the same probability of being measured as a winning state currently. Now, in the classical approach, remember how we told the oracle what the winning value was so it knew what to look for? Well, we've got to do that here too, by applying a controlled Z gate, which also acts as the oracle reflection, and transforms the winning state into its negative value. 
Basically, the oracle, or that black box we refer to, will flip the sign of the winning state so that it's differentiated from the rest. It's essentially a way to just mark the winning state. After the negative phase is applied, the graph looks like this. The winning value, highlighted in purple, now has a negative amplitude, and the average amplitude has also been lowered as a result of this transformation. It's indicated through the dashed line. The final step includes applying a transformation that's known as a diffusion operator. In the code, we apply a Hadamard gate, a poly Z gate, a controlled Z gate, and we finally return back to applying a Hadamard gate once again. Basically, what this does is it reverses the previous transformation after the winning state was marked, and it also triples the original amplitude of the winning value. So now we've got the average amplitude lowered with the winning state at a much higher amplitude value, which means that it increases the winning state's probability and decreases the rest. When put all together, this is what the code looks like. To maximize the accuracy, the quantum computer will repeat steps two and three several times. But don't worry, it's still much faster than a classical computer as we're aware of the significant difference between them. Now, the best part, getting the results by running this algorithm on an actual quantum computer. Here, IBM's Qiskit is going to locate the least busy backend device where the algorithm will run and it'll output whether the job has been successful or not. And thankfully, this one was a success, but we've still got to get the results from our algorithm to determine whether or not it can truly find state 1-1 as the winning answer. Once we've coded the way to acquire the final results, the plot histogram is outputted as you can see. And from 4,000 runs, 3,641 of those result in state 1-1 being the winning value, which is a 91% success rate. The 9% of errors come from the actual quantum computer itself, as it's still an emerging technology that's being developed. But think of it this way. If we can search through unstructured data at such a fast speed when the technology is still being developed, when the technology is fully developed at an even higher accuracy rate, the impact that it'll have on multiple industries will be outstanding to see. And I cannot wait to see what's next in the world of quantum computing. That's a wrap. If you experiment with Grover's algorithm or find anything cool that you want to jam out about, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and I'd love to chat. See you in the next one. Bye.